Hello, thank you everyone for joining us. My name is Nawel Hamidi and I am assistant professor in the School of Leadership, Ecology and Equity. And if you permit, we will start with the territorial acknowledgement. Kwe Anyi, hello everyone, Pijashig, welcome. We would like to acknowledge that Sample University is located on the traditional unceded territory of the Anishinaabe Algonquin people. We would like to honor the Anishinaabe, the first people of the lands and waters of the Kichisibi Ottawa River Valley from time immemorial. We also acknowledge that the site of the city of Ottawa serves as the home of the Anishinaabe, as a place for spiritual ceremonies, cultural gatherings and exchange among first people. Today, this spirit of peace and friendship is the foundation of relations among indigenous people and non-indigenous people from around the globe. So I would like to say also a few words about the lunchtime uh, conversations, being a leader. The series Being a Leader, Lunchtime Conversations, offers opportunity to reflect with organizational and community leaders around the challenges of social transformation with a complex world and to better appreciate the sources we can rely on to act within this world. This series is or these series are organized by the School of Leadership, Ecology and Equity at St. Paul University. Just before we start with our guest today, Mr. David Corey, I would like to uh, present a few, remind few reminders. So this conversation is recorded and will be added on our YouTube channel. We will be sending out the link after the event. We invite you to keep you, uh, your webcam open. Only uh, the videos of those speaking will be shared. Do not hesitate to send your question and or reflection throughout the conversation using the chat. We have some time for question and answer following the conversation with our uh, invited leader. So now I will uh, turn the mic to uh, my colleague, uh, Bianca Britu, who will present our guest for this afternoon. Thank you, Noel, uh, for leading us into this meeting. And I would, uh, it's such a great honor and pleasure to introduce today, uh, David Corey who is a leadership development uh, coach, uh, trainer, and speaker with 20 years of experience in applying the concept of emotional intelligence to individual and organizational performance improvement. David founded one of the first companies in North America to focus on the development of leadership based on emotional intelligence, and he has worked with leaders in organizations around the globe. David's company, the Emotional Intelligence Training Company, hosted the first Vancouver International Conference in July 2006, bringing together emotional intelligence experts, including Dr. Royven Baron from all over the world. He has spoken at the Harvard Medical School, the Cheng School Graduate School of Business, and the Asia HR Conference seven times. He is a global citizen and a heart based educator who has contributed. Um, extensively to humanizing institutions. And uh, David, it's it's been a long time in my in my head to invite you to uh, our conversations in the, the being a leader series and I want to thank you so much for joining us today and uh, to to say that it was such a happy coincidence that in 2019 when I got this job at St. Paul University, um, the rector invited me to have a discussion about developing an emotional intelligence course. And I had just trained with you to be an emotional intelligence coach uh, a few months before that. So it was this, this beautiful convergence of um, interest in emotional intelligence. And I, I really want to thank you for being here with us today. It is my pleasure. Thank you, Bianca, for asking. So I will, uh, I have a few questions for you, and I think some of the questions may flow from our conversation. And um, the first question is, when did you become interested in emotional intelligence and what made you choose this, this framework or this concept for your work? Yeah, thanks, Bianca. I remember it so clearly. It was, uh, it was 1997, uh, and I was teaching uh, leadership 
courses for a post-secondary institution, uh, and they had a they had a training department, and uh, uh, and, and I, I I love the concept of leadership. I, I just thought, you know, if if we can help people to uh, to understand and practice the skills uh, that leaders require, uh, they could be so much more effective. Organizations can be so much more effective. And so I was teaching these leadership courses, and, and I noticed something interesting that we assumed that all the managers coming to these leadership courses had a basic level of personal and interpersonal skills. Uh, and of course, what you all know, everybody on the call knows, is that this is just not the case, that people have varying levels of personal and interpersonal expertise. And so we were teaching them higher order skills like conflict resolution and performance management, uh, just assuming that they had the personal skills to be able to uh, to you know execute uh, these skills back in the workplace and uh, and of course uh, some were able to and others were able to struggle or, or others struggled rather uh, and and so I didn't know how to understand this difference until I went to a, a conference and there was a breakout session on uh, on the emotional quotient inventory the the it was touted as the world's first scientifically validated measure for emotional intelligence and I'd never heard of emotional intelligence before but I just uh, got very excited about this idea that that uh, that that we could be more intelligent about emotions and so I went to the session and the guy who was giving the breakout session uh, was on a cross-country tour uh, he was the founder of the publishing company that publishes the emotional quotient inventory uh, that company is called MHS and his name was uh, dr. Uh, Stephen Stein uh, and uh, and what I heard him talk about was a a set of foundational skills that uh, that determined human effectiveness. Uh, and I thought, wow, if, if I could just spend my entire career teaching people this, they would be so much more effective at whatever they turn their mind to. Uh, I happened to be in the leadership space, so that was my kind of uh, area. That's what I knew. I knew how to sell leadership training. Uh, and so um, that's when I decided to leave my job, uh, set up my company, and uh, and become one of the first companies to offer emotional intelligence uh, development uh, for the purposes of uh, improving leadership and organizations. So that was in 1998 when I set up my company. Thank you, David. And um, why do you think that emotional intelligence is so important in, in leadership? Well, uh, there, are, there are many reasons, uh, Bianca, uh, but the, the one that I frequently talk about uh, is the fact that we are evolving in, uh, as a species, we're evolving, uh, and, and we, we, we are interestingly evolving away from an autocratic or authoritarian uh, type of leadership. If you think back a couple of decades, um, and those of you who are uh, who are a bit older like I am, uh, you will remember that workplaces were generally fairly autocratic and authoritarian. Uh, and uh, what's interesting is that in the late 80s, early 90s, there was this incredible movement towards teams, towards collaborating and working together and having more of a relationship based type organization. Uh, and uh, what, what's interesting is that we told people to, to go into teams, but we didn't offer them any skills, uh, any resources to do that. Uh, and uh, even today, we promote people based largely on technical skills or credentials. Uh, and then we expect them to be leaders without any preparation or training to do so. Uh, and so so what we offer uh, are the skills. Uh, the old style of leadership, autocratic, is very primitive. You, you just have to know the work. Uh, you don't really have to understand people or know people. You just order them around. Uh, and what's interesting about that is that that leads to low engagement uh, and people leaving organizations that haven't figured out that the 20 21st century uh, organizational structure uh, is collaborative. Uh, that organizations that haven't figured that out will see loss. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, some uh, uh, very large uh, organizations uh, uh, 
built on tradition of command and control, namely the military, uh, are some of our biggest clients uh, in the world uh, because they know they need to change their culture or risk not attracting the young talent that they need in order to sustain those organizations. So what we're all about is we're all about shifting and transforming cultures, uh, giving, uh, putting uh, actual skills into the hands of managers uh, who have to be leaders. Uh, and that is required by their organization. Mm, thank you. And in terms of um, those aspects of collaboration, you know, how how do you think that emotional intelligence contributes to building teams and building trust and helping people collaborate better? Yes, absolutely. Well, you you hit on a, a really important word, Bianca, and that is trust. Uh, and um, uh, and we don't uh, we don't really understand trust. We think we understand trust. We certainly know trust when we have it. Uh, we sense it. We feel it. Uh, but we don't necessarily know. And we certainly one of the reasons that I that I I constantly repeat for why we need to teach adults emotional intelligence is that we don't teach kids emotional intelligence. So everybody that is uh, certain you know, um, uh, uh, a baby boomer, Gen X, millennial. Uh, we didn't have these lessons in school when we were young. We didn't learn about our emotions. We didn't learn uh, about establishing relationships. We didn't learn how to fix damaged relationships. Uh, and we didn't learn how to deepen relationships to the point where we have developed trust. So we need to understand these 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 terms, this uh, these terms that we throw around, that we use in common parlance. Uh, we need to really understand what they are and how to create them and how to deepen them. And trust happens, uh, uh, as many people know, uh, by letting people know who we are. Uh, and letting people know who we are uh, is, uh, is vulnerability. Uh, and it take, it's a risk to do that. Uh, but it's the only way to develop trust. Uh, and so the skills of emotional intelligence, particularly emotional expression, managers tell us all the time, why do I have to express my emotions to my colleagues, to my direct reports? Uh, and it's, there's a one word answer and it's trust. We don't trust what we don't know. And if I don't know you, I can't trust you. So we have to teach people to be vulnerable. Uh, and that's a challenging uh, ask. Uh, and we do that in a very strategic way. Uh, we work up to it through our uh, courses and workshops. Uh, we, and uh, in, in our coaching, we prepare and plan for it. Uh, and then we, we ask people to, uh, uh, to reveal themselves to others in appropriate uh, ways a little bit at a time. Mm, thank you. I think that's this what you just share uh, takes me to to that relationship between vulnerability, trust, and courage. And mm. and then I'm wondering how do you think people develop the courage to be vulnerable? Because it's not part of our culture to to express our inner world to others in the workplace, especially. Absolutely. And, you know, we human beings, uh, Bianca, uh, we, we're, we're kind of simple creatures uh, at, at the base of it, uh, and we're extremely complex all at the same time. Uh, but, but one of the things that we, that, we, that we don't do is we don't make changes for the sake of change. We, we only make change when we see the benefit to us, the benefit to those that we care about. Uh, and so, uh, so we, uh, we have to sell managers on, on this idea. Uh, and we sell, we sell this concept of emotional intelligence based on the rewards uh, that, that, they, that it brings. Uh, and so you don't get the deeply connected, trusting relationships of loyalty and commitment uh, without the risk. Uh, and the risk is vulnerability. Uh, and so we are, uh, you know, uh, helping people to understand some of these things that we should be teaching little kids, and we will in the future. Uh, th that's my prediction, that the school of the future will be all about learning about our emotions, this incredible capacity we have as human beings for experiencing emotion, for uh, understanding that emotion either supports uh, our activities, uh, or it hinders our activities, and uh, and and when we don't pay attention to our emotions, uh, when we don't deal with our own emotions, our emotions deal with us uh, in ways that take us away from our goals or take us off our goals, uh, and produce things that uh, that we don't want. 
Hmm. Thank you. Now I realize that as we talk about emotional intelligence, I assume that everybody knows what it is. And I didn't really invite you to, to give us a definition of, of how you see emotional intelligence and maybe the traits of emotional intelligence, if you could do that for our participants. Yes, yes. Uh, emotional intelligence is a sadly misunderstood concept. Uh, people think they know what it means, uh, and they they use it in uh, uh, in in everyday language. But but what it really means is being intelligent about emotions. That's one of the best definitions of emotional intelligence is being intelligent about emotions. There are many models out there. There are dozens of models. Uh, and, um, uh, and there are very few models based on empirical research, uh, interestingly. Uh, and the ones that are not based on empirical research are often missing aspects of being intelligent about emotions. Uh, one of the things that I like about the term is that it best describes how our brains work that our brains do not process logic and reason in an emotional vacuum. Uh, we are constantly processing emotional information and signals and uh, intellectual or cognitive um, uh, uh, processing. It, it all happens in these wonderful brains of ours. Uh, and, um, uh, and, and the people who are afraid of AI, I, I, I tell them, uh, don't be afraid. We, we are nowhere near replicating what the human brain is, is capable of. Um, and we will always need um, uh, prompts or, or programming for, for the technology for the, that we have. Uh, and uh, so we're, we're a long way off from reproducing technology that can actually have an emotional uh, response to a situation or set of circumstances. Uh, the answer is probably in quantum computing, but we're nowhere near that yet. Uh, figuring that out. So, so being intelligent about emotions is one definition. People sometimes want a greater definition. They say, so which model do you use? And then we talk about, well, when you ask the question, how can I be more intelligent about emotions? Then we need to talk about what are the skills? Uh, what are the competencies that are required if we're going to be more intelligent about emotions? Uh, and you mentioned Reuven Bar Own, uh, the fellow uh, who uh, invented the, the world's leading model of emotional intelligence, the one that has the most utility for those of us who are involved in coaching, for those of us who are involved in uh, education and training. Uh, Reuven Bar Own uh, developed the, the quintessential uh, comprehensive uh, foundation model of emotional skills uh, that tell us how to be more intelligent about emotions and uh, and we can we can get into that if you want or we can go in any direction you wish Bianca from there sure I guess you if you can mention the competencies that would be very helpful um... sure yes uh, the, the, the competencies are divided up into five categories uh, of skills and the first category is self-perception. Uh, and self-perception, if you if you think, what is the first what are the first skills to, that are developed in us human beings? And by the way, we all have these fifteen emotional skills to some extent or or other by virtue of our socialization. That we've all been socialized to use these skills to a greater or lesser degree. And so, what we help people to do is we help people to understand their default settings. So the settings that have come about by virtue of your or socialization. Then we talk about whether those skills are actually working for you and serving you, or perhaps they're not serving you as well as they could, in which case the development is uh, a consideration. So self-perception, we we, uh, some people say it comes before we come out into the world, but certainly we come out into the world and we develop a self-perception uh, based on how we're cared for, uh, whether we're nurtured and loved and got the, get the sense that we belong, that we fit in, that we're valued, mm -hmm. that we're worthy and deserving or not. Uh, excuse me, and, and uh, from self-perception, in the model, you'll see it's a wheel model and has some direction to it. And the next area is self-expression. Uh, and that's because uh, we have to self-express or nothing happens for us. And of course, the in, in infant 
in our infant days, we scream, we cry when we're uncomfortable, uh, and things happen for us. We get fed, we get changed, we get nurtured. Again, uh, that self-expression is critical to our effectiveness as human beings. Uh, and the, then the, the third uh, category uh, is the whole area of interpersonal uh relationships uh with others uh, and we don't again we don't study relationships we don't understand them i mean look at the divorce rate the the separation rate uh the the, the lack of success uh, globally with relationships uh what if we taught people how to do relationships how to be in relationship with others how to fix damaged relationships how to improve and strengthen and deepen relationships what if we taught people that uh, and and all of these things can be learned. Uh, the, the fourth area is decision-making. And this is the explicit category of skills where we talk about how uh, logic and reason work uh, with emotion, either for good or if you make bad decisions, for bad. <laughs> so if you make good decisions, you're probably good at this. Uh, and, uh, and really, uh, it, to be even more precise, it's not whether you make good decisions or not. It's about your process of decision making. That's what we're actually measuring with the emotional quotient inventory, where we're measuring whether you can uh, understand procrastination, avoidance, worry, anxiety around problem solving, etc. Uh, and whether you test your perceptions or you take your perceptions at face value, that's reality testing. Uh, and finally, uh, the final category, stress management, uh, because stress is uh, such a, a critical and important part of life. Without stress, we do nothing. Uh, so we need stress. We, we like stress. We put ourselves into stress, but then we have to be able to handle it and deal with it and have good tactics and strategies uh, for making sure that, that stress doesn't take us out. So, uh, so those are the categories of skills. Then the individual skills uh, in self-perception are, are self-regard, uh, how you re regard yourselves. And people say, well, how can self-regard be a skill? Uh, and the answer is that there are ways that we regard ourselves that, that support our goal achievement. And there are ways that we regard ourselves that absolutely hinder our goal achievement. If you think you can't do it, you can't, you probably can't. Uh, and uh, so, uh, so self-regard, uh, self-actualization, we all learned from Maslow, uh, the top of the pyramid. It's about self-action. It's about uh, fulfillment and meaning and purpose. Uh, and then there's uh, emotional self-awareness, just being in touch and aware of our emotions, emotional expression. Again, something that many people forget to do. And we men, we are taught not to pay attention to our emotions and to not express them because that's weakness. And so again, gender is a factor, not again, but gender, there are many factors in our EQ, gender being one of them. Uh, we're we're uh, uh, either supported uh, in, in uh, paying attention to our emotions and expressing those appropriately uh, or we're, or, or, or less so. Uh, and there are many people that, that believe in those gender stereotypes of decades ago. Uh, and if you buy into them, because we're, we've all been socialized into them and we're not critical enough about them, then we fall into the gender stereotype limitations that those present. Uh, th then uh, there's uh, assertiveness. Uh, and um, uh, assertiveness is, is knowing and understanding how to ask for what you want in life. And if you don't learn this well, you, you likely don't get what you want in life. Uh, and, or, and or it's limited. Uh, and and then there's independence. We, we, we uh, start off life completely independent and we spend our lives becoming more independent. So it's understanding that as a process. Uh, then interpersonal relationships themselves, knowing how to make yourself available for relationships, how to find relationships, how to develop relationships, again, how to, how to fix relationships, all of which is critical and required for leadership and team effectiveness in, in, within organizations. All of these are. Uh, and, and then, of course, there's empathy. Uh, paying attention to the emotions of others, uh, critical for uh, developing relationships, critical for, for effective communication. Uh, and we don't often uh, talk enough about empathy uh, as the, the basis for effective communication with others. Uh, and then there's, um, there's social responsibility. 
that uh, that you know we 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 t we talk with organizations about culture change uh, and because they need to shift their culture for to sustain themselves over time uh, and uh, people need to understand that culture change is everyone's responsibility. We all have a responsibility to make this world a better place, uh, and it's not a nice to do. It's not a nice thing to be involved in. It's a requirement for each of us, uh, uh, and so we make that uh, imminently clear to people. Uh, and, and then finally, we get into the decision-making realm. There's problem solving. Uh, as, I, as I mentioned, there's reality testing, uh, which is about understanding unconscious bias. Uh, and, and finally, there's impulse control. Uh, uh, you know, how, how quickly do you come to your conclusions? And, uh, and um, you know, are you able to think things through critically? Uh, critical thinking is an emotional intelligence skill. Uh, interestingly enough. And, and finally, we come to stress management. In, in stress management, there's flexibility, uh, which is self-explanatory. There's stress tolerance. How much can you take? Do you have strategies and tactics to be able to take stress? Uh, and then finally, uh, there's your outlook on the world. It, it, that's optimism. Uh, and, uh, you know, are, are you able to, uh, to have hope? And, uh, and inspire others, motivate people, uh, demonstrate your passion for the work that you do in ways that enrolls others, uh, that brings others along. Uh, managers tell us, uh, I'm not an optimist or a pessimist, I'm a realist. Well, nothing in, especially wrong with that, uh, but one of the jobs of leaders is to inspire others. And you're, you're not inspirational when you're uh, a realist. You're only inspirational when you talk about uh, what's possible and the benefits and demonstrate your enthusiasm to others. Wow, that's a tour de force in the <laughs> definition of, uh, of emotional intelligence. Thank you for that, David. I I would like to stay a little bit with what you said about um, unconscious bias, and I'm wondering how how is it possible to use emotional intelligence to work with unconscious bias? Sure, yeah. So, so uh, one of the first things that where where we start is with perception uh, that um, uh, that our five senses are feeding us information all the time. Uh, and uh, and then it's understanding how our brains process that. And I think it's absolutely fascinating. And um, uh, most people don't know that we that much of what we know about the brain, uh, we we actually learned in the 90s. Uh, and the reason is that the functional magnetic resonance imaging technology, fMRI, was only invented in 1991. Uh, and I just think that's absolutely fascinating that we had MRI before that. We had magnetic resonance imaging. So we knew about anatomy and physiology and structure, but we didn't know as much about function until 1991. And that's when uh, the uh, neuroscience researchers were blown away uh, at that emotion had such a huge role uh, in our behavior and in our functioning. Uh, and and uh, the famous neuroanatomist Jill Bolte Taylor some of you will recognize that name because she has a famous TED talk where she talks about her experience of having a stroke. Can you imagine having a stroke as a neuroanatomist uh, knowing what parts of your brain were shutting down and, and what that experience, and she describes that experience. But she said in her famous book, My Stroke of Insight, she said, before 1990, we thought that we were thinking creatures who felt. Now we know beyond a shadow of a doubt, we're feeling creatures who think. This is why we're talking about emotion in the 21st century uh, is because neuroscience research tells us that, uh, and we've known this a long time. Aristotle wrote, to be angry is easy, but to be angry with the right person in the right way at the right time for the right reason, uh, that's hard. He was talking about appropriate uh, emotional expression in you know, 600 BC or whenever Aristotle wrote that. Uh, and um, uh, he also wrote, education without educating the heart is no education at all. So the, 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 the cynics, uh, the, the ancient Greek philosophers, they all knew about emotion, the role that emotion plays, uh, and, uh, and they wrote about it. Uh, and, and yet we, we uh, uh, haven't really been uh, you know, taken by the, 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 the shirt collar and shaken and, and, uh, until now. Uh, and, and said, if you don't figure out how to get better at emotions, um, you, someone is going to press a button and blow us all up. 
uh, because the symptoms of a lack of emotional intelligence abound, and you're all familiar with them. They are misunderstanding at the low end, the, the low impact end. Misunderstandings abound because we're not clear with each other. We don't ask for what we exactly want. We drop hints and clues and expect people to figure it out. And, uh, and there are things that we'd rather not talk about because they make us uncomfortable. Uh, one of the things that we say frequently in our courses and workshops is that you have to get comfortable with what is uncomfortable comfortable. Uh, and you have to be able to have those difficult conversations. You, be able, you have to be able to experience emotion, even if it's unpleasant. Now, we don't talk about emotions as positive or negative. We talk about them as pleasant or unpleasant, because mm. if we talk about them as positive or negative, people will start thinking that there are emotions that they should be feeling and emotions that they should not be feeling. They'll judge their own emotions, which is not helpful. Uh, again, we've got to we've got to be able to explore beneath the surface uh, of of ourselves and get comfortable with our own emotions. Uh, and uh, and there are so so many uh, uh, so many paradoxes and uh, so many contradictions. Uh, for example, we don't teach kids how to deal with pain. So my guess is those of you who have dealt with unimaginable trauma or tragedy and that kind of pain, you nobody taught you how to deal with it. You had to figure it out once you were in it. How humane is that? How, how helpful is that? It, it's not. Uh, and so we have to tackle some difficult uh, topics, including beliefs, Bianca. Beliefs enter into this whole area of whether you are or are not emotionally intelligent. So what you believe about people, what you believe about, uh, about uh, the intentions of others, uh, what, what, you, uh, what you believe about yourself, uh, what you believe about life. If you believe that life is to be suffered and endured, well, you're going to have a different perspective on these skills than if you believe that life uh, it, it has the op it creates the opportunity for us to thrive uh, as human beings. This model was originally created as a model for mental health, uh, and these are coping skills. Um, uh, at 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 least we happen to use them to help people to thrive. So uh, again, it's a it's a multifaceted, extremely complicated uh, topic area, uh, and uh, we could talk for days, and I could talk for hours about it, as you can as you can tell, Bianca. So so maybe you want to rein me in a bit and uh, ask some questions. I can see that uh, that you're really passionate about uh, this topic, and I'm. Um... In, in terms of this idea of teaching uh, people uh, about emotions, I know that that for a long time, I think that there, there used to be this belief that these are things that you cannot teach, right? Or that teaching is, you know, this scholastic way of teaching people how to be in relationships or teaching them how to go through grief was seen with a lot of suspicion. And I'm wondering what, what you think about that. How, how, how do you teach differently when you teach about emotions? Yeah, well, uh, it, it, it's, it's interesting. You know, you know I, I studied to be a secondary school teacher many, many years ago. Uh, and I had a professor uh, who, who firmly believed in putting things into the hands of students. Uh, and uh, uh, I, I thought it was interesting, an interesting idea. But what he was doing was he was wanting students to experience the concepts that he was trying to get across. Uh, and um, uh, and I, I uh, always enjoyed his classes. Everybody did. They were fun. They were interesting. Uh, and... Um, uh, and and so it was uh, about creating the experience, uh, and so so that's what we have to do. Uh, if we're going to teach about emotions, uh, we have to have some theory, obviously, because uh, there is some information that's required. But then we have to create the experience. How do we create? Uh, ways for people to experience emotions, for people to interact with each other, uh, for people to have uh, conversations, which allows them in a way to, uh, you know, have something uh, in their hands, so to speak. It's not tangible, but it's asking them to interact with this concept. And so that's that's how we, uh, our, uh, our workshops and courses are extremely interactive. Um, uh, uh, people, 
uh, are amazed that we do this virtually, that we use breakout rooms in the way that we use them. And we have people coming back from breakout rooms, uh, laughing and, and having a good time uh, and really experiencing what we're talking about and what we're wanting to get across to them. And we, um, uh, we, um, uh, basically uh, challenge them in, in, in small little ways at first, uh, leading up to bigger and bigger challenges. And, and if they're willing to rise to the challenge uh, and really experience what it means to take a risk and then the reward that comes from taking the risk, then they see the payoff and they will take it back and they will use this uh, in, their, uh, in their personal life. The, the most humorous feedback we ever got was from a physician whose wife asked him what medication he had prescribed himself because he was a different guy. And we asked him, what did you do to get that uh, comment from your wife? And he said, I just used what I learned in the workshop with my family. I, I realized that I actually wanted to have a better relationship with my adolescent um, uh, son. Uh, and uh, I wanted to be a more present uh, husband, father, uh, uh, and um, uh, I just, uh, you know, those things were valuable to me and I took what I learned back and I used it. Uh, and so, you know, we, uh, I, I, I say to a room full of people, uh, how many people came here today to change their life? Uh, and very few people put up their hands. And I say, well, you may not have come here to change your life. Uh, the, what I'm going to talk with you about today has the potential to change your life. Uh, and I'm going to ask you again at the end of the day. Uh, uh, who's going to change their lives? Because that's my goal for you, is to change your life for the better, that you can make everything better, that the, those things that you think are where you have no choice over, you probably do have some choice over. Life is full of choices, even what you choose to believe. Uh, and so if what you believe is serving you, great. Keep believing it. But if what you believe is not serving you, is oppressive to you or someone else, then change that belief uh, because we want to believe what serves us. We want to believe what helps uh, and supports our growth and development and makes the world a better place. Any belief that doesn't make the world a better place needs to be modified, needs to be debated, needs to be discussed uh, and, uh, and faced and, uh, and changed. Uh, so, uh, so all of these factors go into creating a, a more emotionally intelligent human uh, and uh, serve to uh, create a more emotionally intelligent world for all of us mm, beautiful i i have one last question for you um david and um do you think that emotional intelligence has now become more mainstream in the business world in the education world how do you see this this larger transformation or impact of emotional intelligence yeah, it's so in, so interesting, Bianca, that uh, if you adhere to one of the limited definitions of emotional intelligence, uh, those are the ones that we're seeing that are uh, are kind of going away and, and fading. Uh, there was a time when all the top business schools in the world, including Stanford, Harvard, INSEAD, uh, and many others, um, uh, all had courses on leading with emotional intelligence. Uh, and now those, those uh, have changed, and, and there is some uh, there. There is uh, some who see emotional intelligence as a bit of a trend. Uh, what what they don't see is they don't see the a util, utilitarian model like the one we use. Something that's practical, usable, grounded in research. Uh, they don't see that as helping them with the contemporary topics of the day, which are diversity, equity, inclusion, creating psychological safety. That's what we that's what we lead with we say hey you want psychological safety you want diversity equity and inclusion then you need to to uh, resource your leaders with these skills uh, it, it was uh, it was uh, creating the agile organization you want an agile organization then you need your leaders to have these skills uh, it was six Sigma you want six Sigma uh, what what many of these programs and and uh, and trends leave out is what 
what do you teach managers so that they can implement these programs uh, more effectively? Uh, and that is the case with diversity, equity, and inclusion right now. Uh, people are teaching about diversity, equity, and inclusion, but they're not resourcing leaders. And this is often a, uh, a place that many organizations fail to close the loop in, in resourcing leaders to be able to carry, these, carry out these wonderful programs and strategies. Mm, thank you. So I see that uh, you notice some of the, uh, I would say, the the dynamics that involve emotional intelligence nowadays and how it's being uh, viewed um, as as a resource or as as a concept that is helpful for so many other concepts. Um, and maybe because I. Uh, I just I would like to use the maximum the time uh, um, we have together. I'm I'm wondering um, about your own experience as a leader and if you think that emotional experience, uh, emotional intelligence has uh, contributed to who you are as a leader. Yeah, yeah. You know what I realized, Bianca, was that that there there is a different EQ profile for different purposes and objectives, and uh, and so you know it, it's it. I, I used to think when I first started using the the assessment tool, the EQI, that higher was better. That if you scored higher, that was better. Well, no, it's it's not. Uh, there there is an appropriate, an optimal balance, if you will, of all. All these skills for each one of us, depending on who we are and what we want out of life and out of work, etc. Uh, and so I, I uh, thought at one time that I wanted to build a big company with offices all over the world and and uh, all kinds of employees. Uh, and then I realized that that's not me. That I'm not that kind of leader. That that uh, you know I I am not uh, you know a Bill Gates or an Elon Musk or or a Jeff Bezos. That's uh, and, and in fact, if you think about those individuals. Uh, they're the kind of individual that you want if you want to build a valuable company. But they're not, they're not the kind of people that you want to hang out with. They would not make good friends. Uh, you don't want to go and have coffee with them. They, that would not be a pleasant experience. And so it's about what you want in your life and who you want to be surrounded by and what you want for yourself. And so we've, we've uh, chosen to stay small. We're a small group of people across the country. Um, we uh, have kept things. Uh, so again, it's, it's constantly checking in with what it is that you value. What are your priorities? What kind of life? What kind of uh, 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 work do you want to create for yourself, build for yourself, uh, and then you know develop your EQ skills so that you can do that? Uh, and I think that what I've done is I've tried to you know improve my own EQ skills to create what what's good for me, what's right for me. Uh, you can see all my instruments behind me. Uh, I I absolutely love and have a passion for creating music and uh, and performing and uh, and so you know. Uh, uh, that's what I do in my spare time. I I, I work all, during the day and then evenings and weekends is about music for me. So, so again, it's what do you want in your life? Are you setting your life up the way you want it to be set? Uh, do you have the resources that you need in order to achieve what you want? And so uh, that's what it is for me. So uh, it's it's not a huge company. It's I'm not building up something to sell. Uh, I, I'm building up something to that I'm going to slowly back away from in my retirement years. Um, uh, and uh, hopefully it continues on and with the right people in the right places. So thank you. That's wonderful. I, I really appreciate your uh, your responses today and I hope that that, uh, that they have been helpful for for those of us uh, um, for those listening to us. And I would like now to open the floor for questions and and invite Noel to to lead us into that. Thank you so much, David. Yes, so you are uh, invited to share your questions or just raise your hand. Um, so we do have <laughs> a very uh, interesting question by Agnès Richard. Um, she's asking what kind of music do you like to learn and perform? Yeah, I'm I'm very much influenced by um, uh, by the singer songwriters of our of our time, uh, Bob Dylan, uh, John Prine, uh, Jimmy Buffett, the Eagles, James Taylor, um, uh, Bruce Coburn. These are all my favorites, and uh, and and then the songs that I write, I I, I are, are all emotional intelligence songs. They're all about uh, the experiences of life, uh, 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 about. Um, uh, 
uh, joy and pain and uh, and uh, it, it's a, it's a real mix of of all kinds. I thought I wanted to be a children's entertainer when my kids were young and I was younger, uh, and I recorded an album of original children's music. I hired the best studio musicians in Vancouver at the time, and it remains one of the best kept secrets in Canadian music. Um, uh, and, um, uh, but, uh, children's music is no longer my passion. My passion is, uh, writing about life. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, we have another question from Christine Cooley. So how can you best address incidences of unintelligent emotional communication in an emotionally intelligent way, especially in these days of such division and extreme views mm, uh, absolutely and uh it, it, when you when you say division and extreme views i know what you're talking about it really came out and was pronounced during covid and it was most unfortunate uh and you know you you can't change anyone else uh, and so all you can do is, is develop your own skills uh, so that uh, so that you're expressing yourself in a way that has integrity uh, for you, uh, a way that fits with your values and, and your priorities. Uh, and uh, and, you know, find out find out ways to to be able to be in conversation with people who are difficult perhaps because it is re required uh, there's no getting away from them uh, and um, uh, and so you can develop your skills in that area uh, there are you know I've I've uh, I've read many of the conversation books I haven't read all of them uh, but the the one that started it off for me was difficult conversations it was written in the early 80s uh, and it was a brilliant brilliant book that's that spawned a whole um, uh, a spate of copycat type books like crucial conversations, fierce conversations, conversational intelligence. Uh, another one of my favorites, uh, Marshall Rosenberg's Nonviolent Communication. So there's all these wonderful books on being able to, to communicate your truth. Uh, what you feel is your truth. It's not the truth, but uh, how you feel is your truth. And to be able to express your truth to people, uh, even if it includes, uh, I, 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 I uh, uh, actually feel like uh, leaving the room is <laughs> that's not an emotion but i feel like leaving the room when you speak to me like that uh and um if you continue to speak to me like that that's conversations over so to have that kind of assertiveness to be able to to you know not be around people that uh that that are toxic or that um uh that that are, are struggle they, uh, that struggle with life they they say that hurting people hurt people and so if people hurt you they are likely hurting so how can you use your empathy uh, to uh, to possibly let them know that you care about them, uh, but they're difficult to be in relationship with. Uh, this this kind of thing to to be able to talk about difficult truths uh, is truly a, uh, an emotional intelligence skill. Mm. Thank you. Uh, we have another question, which is a little bit in the same line, from Julie Laflamme. Uh, bonjour. Yesterday in the eclipse moment, I tried to provoke emotions for my mom and her sister by playing their favorite music. I did not succeed. They were talking all the time, no focus on emotion. They are like that. What is the most effective strategies for, uh, strategy for colleagues that are closed and not showing their soft side and cry? Thank you. Well, uh, the, the example is a great example of unclear communication. Uh, what you wanted was not what you asked for. You just put the music on and, and they kept talking. So, so uh, it, to be really clear, it might have been, can we just be quiet and listen to the music? Uh, and then talk after about the eclipse uh, might have been expressing what you wanted in that in that situation. Uh, and again, we 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 it, it happens so frequently that we have to get better and clearer at uh, at communication. Brene Brown, who we love by the way, uh, writes about emotional intelligence without using the term emotional intelligence very much. But she um, uh, she says the the most boundaried people. Uh, are the most loving and generous. Uh, and if you think about that, it's like, really, the people with the most boundaries? When you're clear about what you want and what you don't want in your relationships with others, then you can be loving and generous with them without it uh, turning into some sort of resentment. So again, we have to get the balance right between our needs and the needs of those around us. How do we get that balance 
uh, correct. Uh, when the balance tilts, then there's the possibility of resentment on one side or the other. It's like when, when we take too much time for ourselves, uh, that's going to affect others and impact others. And it's understanding that uh, relationships are about negotiation and compromise. And so we have to get better at negotiating, uh, better at compromising, uh, and, and better at living and working together. Thank you. Um, I will move to another question, sure. if you agree. So we have another interesting question from Iman. How can we as emerging leaders create a more equitable workplace environment for individuals of visible minority groups? Yes, absolutely. Uh, this uh, we we have a presentation uh, on um, diversity, equity, inclusion, and emotional intelligence, uh, and in it we outline steps that people can take at the very end. And those steps include start having these conversations. So you want to bring someone in to discuss diversity, equity, inclusion. What do they mean? What what are the, what? Uh, uh, why do we say equity and not equality? Uh, what is what is it? Uh, it, it Having diversity is not it. It's it's about uh, implementing inclusion. What does that mean? How do we uh, how do we actually help people to feel like ultimately they belong uh, to that workplace? How do we create an inclusive environment of belonging? We need to bring people in to give talks on the subject. We need to start talking about it at our staff meetings. A and leaders need to develop their skills to be able to have these difficult conversations, to have the empathy, to be on the lookout for uh, instances where that, that might in fact be uh, interpreted as microaggressions by uh, by visible minorities or people with various diversity dimensions, just to talk about what is a diversity dimension um, uh, and, and what does that mean for, for each one of us? Uh, there are the, we use the, the power and privilege wheel. If you haven't seen the power and privilege wheel, Google it. You, you'll see that at the center is me. <laughs> Old white guys who are able-bodied and educated, that, that's where at the center uh, of that uh, that wheel of power and privilege. Uh, and uh, and then depending on the diversity dimension, you are uh, you can locate yourself on the wheel. You can talk about what does this mean for our team? What does this mean for us? Uh, you know, how can we challenge those unconscious biases, make them conscious? It's the only thing we can do with unconscious biases is to make them conscious. Uh, and one of the reasons for the, the, the re race relation difficulties we have is the difficulty of white people to acknowledge we've been socialized to be white supremacists. We have to acknowledge this in ourselves. Uh, and I, I take every opportunity to recommend Robin DeAngelo's book, White Fragility. It is a powerful, powerful book. Uh, and she says we are socialized into this uh, way of viewing races. We need to challenge it and we need to teach our kids differently. We need to know better in order to do better. And it's the same with emotional emotions and emotional intelligence. We need to know more about how emotions uh, affect affect our lives and our work uh, and uh, and try to do better. So the conversation is becoming more and more interesting. We don't want to leave you go. So maybe we'll have to 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 get you um, or to have another conversation with you, David. We really appreciate uh, the time you've taken to discuss with us, to share your knowledge, your experience, your expertise as well, and also show us how emotional intelligence is very uh, uh, an element that will also not only bring better relations, maybe peace around us, but also perhaps heal our relations. Um, so that that was uh, very uh, inspiring. Uh, I'm sure many of us will now be uh, very interested to look into your sources and, as well as your work. So thank you so much for your presence and thank you for to everybody for having uh, being present today. Um, I would like to make a few announcements just to conclude our uh, meeting today. So on the 8th of May, we will have uh, another uh, event called Cultivating the Soil, Cultivating Transformative Change, a conversation with Sister Linda Craig 
Uh, she will discuss leadership, ecology, spirituality, and social change through her various lenses as a master of organic gardener, educator, and spiritual accompanier. Uh, just a few words also on our graduate program in leadership, ecology, and equity, um, and uh, our uh, graduate diploma in diversity, um, equity, diversity, um, and inclusion. Uh, we are now open for uh, application. We invite you to contact us for more information if you need. And finally, uh, you can follow us on social media uh, to stay updated uh, with uh, our webinars, workshops, and activities of the School of Leadership, Ecology and Equity and Spirituality, and the Providence uh, Institute for Transformative Leadership, who are also, uh, which is also hosting many activities. So thank you so much again, uh, David Corey, for your presence and Bianca Brichu for this uh, beautiful um, event. We wish you uh, a beautiful day. Thank you. Thank you so much.